Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast Mobility Masterclass, the future of employee relocation, sponsored by Urbanbound. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. You will receive an email from hr.com within two business days, which will include your certification credit information. You may also log into hr.com and go to your View My Credits page where you can see the credits you have received. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A in your webinar controls and enter them there. I will post a link to the slides and the exit survey in the chat area once the presentation has started. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast is ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Rebecca Stevens and Michael Craftsman. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Michael Craftsman. I'm the CEO of Urbanbound. I am down in lovely Austin, Texas at the Indeed headquarters with Rebecca Stevens, Indeed's Director of Global Mobility. Hi, everyone. So today, Rebecca and I will be talking about the future of employee relocation. But before we begin, I want to give you all a little background about us and why we're talking about this important subject. First, I want to formally introduce our very special co-presenter, Rebecca. As I mentioned before, uh, she is the Director of Global Mobility at Indeed, where she is responsible for the Global Immigration and Mobility Programs. She has two decades worth of experience in the mobility industry as both a client and a service provider. Rebecca is a flagship member of the Austin Relocation Council and an innovative thought leader in the industry. Thanks for being with us today. I appreciate that warm welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. Well, seeing as I'm at your office, I should probably be saying thanks for you having me. <laughs> anyway, I'm Michael Craftsman, as I mentioned earlier, CEO and co-founder of Urbanbound. Urbanbound is the leading provider of relocation management technology to help companies digitally administer, track, and optimize relocation benefits, as well as provide a seamless employee experience. Our goal has been to modernize the relocation industry by putting technology at the forefront. Since 2011, we have been building software to help innovative companies provide stress-free relocations for their employees. Okay, so before we officially begin, I want to encourage everyone to ask questions we want to take advantage of Rebecca's expertise, and the second half of this presentation will be dedicated to Q&A with Rebecca pending time. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, no pressure. <laughs> That's right. For the first half of the presentation, Michael and I will be talking about relocation trends in a more presentation-like style. Then the second half of the webinar, we'll open it up to more casual Q&A. Exactly. And with that, for those of you just joining us, welcome to the Mobility Masterclass, the future of employee relocation. I want to go over our agenda today, and you'll see on the screen that we will cover some of the major consumer trends we're seeing and the impact those consumer trends have on relocation and the more general HR space. Then we'll cover the rise of remote work and telecommuting and how this affects relocation. Lastly, we'll cover an update on the 2018 tax reform laws and discuss some ways to control costs due to that legislation. Then the fun part, for the second half of this presentation, Rebecca and I will have a more candid conversation and talk about what some of the most innovative companies are doing to leverage relocation as a way to attract talent and answer some questions that have come in over the last couple of weeks before the webinar as well as anything that we are able to cover that comes through during the session. Great, let's do this. Let's do it, okay. So we are going to start by discussing the consumer trends that we are seeing and examine how those trends affect the way companies relocate employees. But to back up for a second, we probably have a few people on the line wondering, why should we even care about consumer trends? <laughs> we probably do, Michael. But to understand why we're talking about this, we have to look at a bigger macro trend that's happening right now in the world, the war for talent. At the end of last month, we saw a 3.7% US unemployment rate, the lowest since 1969. And because of this, companies are seeing a significant skills gap, which is really the biggest thing impacting companies today, in my opinion. 
And in order to win this war for talent, companies need to set themselves apart. Offering relocation as a benefit is one way to do just that. That's right. Almost two years ago, Indeed decided that offering a lump sum payment was no longer their approach that they at the time we now wanted to take when it came to mobility. So lucky for me, they brought me on to develop and implement a program that would be competitive and align with hiring strategies. It's very typical for smaller companies or startups to offer lump sums, um, but there becomes a time when those no longer work or scale and a more competitive approach is needed. That's a really great point. Just because the company offers a relocation benefit like a lump sum doesn't mean it's going to win that war for talent. Think of it this way. Say you have you know, two companies, company A and company B, and both claim to offer health insurance. Company A, let's say, pays for 100% of the premium, and company B only covers 25% of the premium. Guess which company is going to win that candidate if that is the factor that the candidates are looking at. Both of them offer health insurance, but one policy is clearly better than the other. This is really the same for relocation. You can offer a relocation as the benefit, and, you know, let's say check a box, but if you don't offer it the right way, it can actually hurt you in the end. Exactly. So one way to create a competitive, better relocation offering is to pay heed to consumer trends. So when a company takes into account the behaviors and expectations happening in the consumer world and applies it to their company's relocation policy, it can beneficially impact the quality that the prospective candidate evaluates and how they evaluate an organization. So let's take an example of a company only offering a lump sum payment. For little to no additional cost, a company can offer support and resources to go along with the money. You know what, that goes a long way. This can be a real game changer. I think it's a huge misconception that relocating employees just want money, but the reality is they want flex. they do want money, but they want flexibility and they want help with the best way to stretch the dollars they're given. That's right. And this is why it's so important to pay attention to consumer trends. Consumers want flexibility, they want options, and they want help. And because relocation has mattered uh, as in, has matured faster in the last four years than it has in the last four decades, it's more important to be paying attention to these trends now than say even just a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's right. So I guess this brings us to our first trend, the rising expectation of technology. Agree. The face of the average consumer and thus worker is changing every single day with more millennials, most of whom are digital natives or people that grew up using and understanding digital technology, making up almost 50% of the workforce. That's crazy because when I first started in this industry two decades ago, thanks for telling everyone, <laughs> um, as a relocation consultant, each relocation had a paper file. We worked off the phone, fax, if anybody knows what that is, <laughs> and email, and there weren't any web portals at the time. So, um, and really, relocation technology just started to advance, I would say, with the internet about 10 to 12 years ago, but users were learning how to use it for the first time. So it was a completely new way of operating and essentially a new language, right? So we were a lot more tolerable back then, but if, it was, if it's not exceptional now, we don't want it. Back then, we didn't know better. Yeah. Now, however, a, you know, a growing number of consumers have spent their entire lives using the internet, attached to their phones, and receiving digital care and customer support. These digital natives have completely different standards and expectations. They want an immediate, exceptional, personalized experience. And since there are so many options at consumers' fingertips, if an application or a website has poor design, it really isn't going to last. Exactly. And consumer to, consumers today have gotten to the point where they fully understand good design and they can detect bad design. So this is why companies today have started to think about user experience since the users actually care about the experience. Yeah, and that should be a huge call to action for any company offering relocation. How the benefit is delivered absolutely matters. And we're finally starting to see a shift in the relo industry. Something that's been historically done offline is now moving online. But I want to be very clear. This does not mean that all those that are relocating just want to interact with software. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Absolutely. We definitely will. But since the day my co-founder Jeff and I started Urbanbound, I've always thought about relocation in comparison to the travel industry. 
Think about how people traveled 30 years ago. You didn't have the information at your fingertips, so you had to call a travel agent who had access to all that information. They had access to the flight schedule, they had access to the hotel options and the pricing to go along with all of that. So you would describe to them what you're looking for. An agent would get you to, you know, they would get to work, they would start doing their process, possibly over several days, and come back with some options. Then they'd call you, maybe a few days later, and they'd say, hey, you know, here are the four to five options that seem to work based on what you told me, and then they'd lay them out for you to decide. You know, you compare that fast forward time to Expedia or any of the travel sites that have obviously come on the scene in the last, you know, decade or so, and you know, you, you think about it, you plug in your basic travel dates, the times, destinations, and in seconds, you have all the options at your fingertips. You can book everything with the click of the button, and if you wanna make a change, you push a few more buttons. And the key here is there's a lot of consumer options in that arena now. Right, so essentially, that's where relocation should be headed, especially if millennials will soon make up 50% of the workforce. They not only want intuitive personal software, but expect it. It's important to identify how you're administer, administering your company's reload benefits. Exactly. I guess the key thing to remember here is that consumers have become adept at understanding what a good experience is like, given all the other aspects of their life that have moved into the digital age. So the expectations for relocation need to be held at a higher standard than they were, even more so than just a few years ago. So now let's talk about the other trend of everything being available to you when you want it. Yes, so we're living in an on-demand world. If you think about it, the consumer mind has set complete, the, com the consumer mindset, excuse me, has completely shifted from thinking about something well in advance to instant gratification. Gone are the days of planning for something and essentially having longer overall thought process when making any buying decisions. So now the thought process is more like, I'm hungry, I want Chinese food, where's my Grubhub on my phone? Um, and it's delivered within an hour. Exactly. And we can do this whenever we're ready. We don't need to coordinate in advance. You need to go somewhere, I don't need to arrange for a car service. I open Uber or Lyft and a car comes and picks me up in minutes. This on-demand economy brings instant gratification and in return, it has brought a level of impatience, in my opinion, that has been programmed yeah. into the consumer psyche. Right. It used to be okay for something to take a while. Now it's expected that systems should be able to deliver exactly what you want, exactly the way you want it, exactly now. <laughs> when you want it, exactly. Yeah. Plus, consumers want to be able to track that status of whatever it is, whether it's your food order that you described earlier, or their Uber, or their Amazon order. Everything needs to be trackable in real time. They want notifications that their food is being prepared or that their ride is two minutes away or a text message that confirms that their package has been delivered, uh, probably with a photo to prove that it has. Consumers want to be in the know at all times. And as a result, nobody has any patience anymore. And I just want to point out that I for sure am not immune to this. I used to walk to a major street, you know, in Chicago and stand outside and wait for a taxi for at least 10 minutes. Now, if I see that my Uber is more than five minutes away, I'll open up a Lyft and see if there's one closer. If it says, you know, two minutes away, I'll cancel my Uber and order a Lyft. It's really become that crazy. Me too, Michael. <laughs> so what do impatience cons impatient consumers mean for employee relocation? Well, you know, I feel like it basically comes down to this. In order to remain competitive and attract top talent, you have to make sure that your relocation benefits are available at all times and on demand. Your employees shouldn't really have to wait for a relocation company to open for the day to begin coordinating their move. Think about it. Moving in and of itself is stressful. We've all probably been there. It can be one big logistical nightmare. People don't want to sit and wait for someone to call them to start the relocation process. Your employees probably will want to just take things into their own hands. And if that means getting online at 2 a.m., that means 2 a.m., I actually can't tell you how many urban bound users we see logging in after working hours. And I think what's important here is employees don't just want snazzy user interface that's available 24 seven, but sometimes that means they want instant chat with a reload consultant or even dare I say it, a phone call. <laughs> and there's a misnomer that younger pop, the younger population doesn't want to talk to anyone. I don't think that that's true. The on demand trend means they want options and they want the options 
that they want when they want them, like we were saying. So I'm guilty of this too. For example, I have an Amazon shopping problem. It's easy, fast, and I can compare prices. But recently I had an order not arrived. And you know what? I've emailed the seller three times. I can't figure out how to get a hold of a live person. And I'm sure if I spent more than three minutes looking for a phone number before giving up, that option is there somewhere. But my point is I needed help. I need help. I still haven't gotten the package. <laughs> and it wasn't easily available to, um, to me to figure out how to get in touch with someone for the help. So I think that's very applicable in relocation as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I guess we all probably want to avoid unhappy relocating employees. But building on that, another way to make employees happy um, is to really allow them to be able to track the status of their relocation. You know, if you provide your employees with a platform for them to organize and see their move progressing in real time, it makes the whole situation a little easier to comprehend, a little easier to wrap their heads around a major life event like moving. Even if your company offers a lump sum only or a signing bonus, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that your employees don't want to wait until their first paycheck or their second paycheck to see that money actually come into their bank account. They don't. And they have needs that are going to happen before they, they start, the right? Yep. Um, they also don't want to wait for the paper check. That's why companies really have to get into the on-demand mindset. If you're only going to offer your employees cash, it's certainly going to be a much better experience for them to get the money before they move. Even better, they can initiate this process online. And so instead of filling out a paper direct deposit to form and an emailing a payroll manager, um, they can, they have a better option. They can get into an online portal where they can put in their bank account information and see the funds transferred into their account in a few days, which is so much better. Um, they, they probably don't even like that couple of days, but it's <laughs> not that first paycheck. It's better than weeks or months. Right. And it's different with reimbursement too. I can tell you if your employees don't want to wait five minutes for an Uber, they certainly don't want to wait for an expense report to be approved. That's totally true. So, you know, we have, you know, I, I think we've been talking about how time is precious and it brings us to really another consumer trend that's affecting the way companies offer relocation benefits, the rise of multitasking. So what do I mean by this? Well, it's the rise of certain types of technologies that have really trained consumers to feel like they have to optimize every single hour and every single minute of their day. We have restless mind syndrome. Mm -hmm. So remember how we're less patient? With the rise in popularity of things like audiobooks and podcasts, we don't like our minds to be idle. Six million Americans listen to podcasts on a weekly basis. Embarrassing fact, Michael, based on my Audible app, I've spent three months, 13 days, two hours, and five minutes of my life listening to audiobooks. <laughs> um, and that doesn't include the minutes on my commute this morning. So we've gotten to a point where people feel like there's not enough time to do all they want to do in life. So anything that allows us to multitask is considered a good thing. Yeah. And this goes beyond listening to podcasts and audiobooks during the daily commute. It can mean multitasking across their devices. Think about it. Consumers own more devices than ever before between laptops, smartphones, tablets, e-readers, the voice assistants they have in their house now. The list is really endless. And they're spending an increasing amount of time on them, constantly cycling through a series of different apps as they move from device to device. Yeah, that's right. So consumers can use a multitude of screens to maintain a consistent connection to their social networks, media, entertainment, games, and news. Think about it. You can listen to Spotify playlist on your Google Home while scrolling through your email on your phone while the TV plays the morning news. Basically, consumers are busier and more distracted than they've ever been. Yes, and I'm included in that as well. So the question is, how can this impact relocation? Well, if you think about it, if people want to cram as much as they can into their day, the old way of doing relocation really doesn't make much sense. A challenge with the previous way that relocation was handled is that it was a very linear approach that would rely on phone call appointments with various relocation consultants and different suppliers. The old way of thinking about it means your employees would have to provide their undivided attention to that one thing at that moment. With software driving things now, employees can begin their relocation process um, on their phone, take a break, 
maybe watch TV, talk to their family, open up their laptop, and then log back in and continue their relocation process. It doesn't need to be done all at once and on one device. And furthermore, they can be listening to that audiobook while they do it. Yes, they can. <laughs> um, so when you're building out relocation policies, and really this goes for any type of employee benefit, think about it from the employee's perspective and find a solution that can be accessed online on any device that also has an option to connect with a real life human. That's right. Now really, the last consumer trend that we were gonna talk about today is probably the least developed in the relocation industry. However, I feel like we can confidently predict that this is where the industry is going. It certainly is where I'm thinking things are going from our perspective at Urbanbound. So what is it that we're talking about? AI, also known as artificial intelligence. This is a genre of research and development to get software to be more human-like. See Questworld. How do we get computers to think and behave like humans? Exactly. But where it stands today, we're not quite to that whole futuristic robots have feelings thing just yet. As it stands today, AI is basically a trend towards people being less tolerant of dumb software. Think about it from decade to decade. First, we had no expectation of software being intelligent with you know, early word processing and you know, applications of that nature. And then Microsoft thrilled the world with Clippy, the paperclip assistant. Remember him? He used to say things like, looks like you're writing a letter. Need any help? Fast forward to now, and software can leverage what it's learning about everybody else before you and get you to the right place as a result. What's happening now is software is helping a user to actually define their intent and is helping a user to get what they need done quicker. It's able to understand what the user's behavior is. In other words, what they're trying to do. Exactly. And as a result, it can offer a completely unique experience that doesn't feel static, but feels seamless and feels right. Take, for example, at Indeed, we have a team of engineers working on AI that can detect fake resumes or false information in a resume. This helps protect our clients and give them a better user experience, as well as save time for everyone. That is really cool. Or really, think about how two people who are sitting right next to each other can type the exact same thing into a Google search, and they'll both get completely different results. Why is that the case? It's because Google is building a profile, an understanding of what things each user is actually interested in based on their past behavior, and then it's using their artificial intelligence to actually serve up personalized results to that person. Right, and you see AI manifest in different ways. There are chat box, bots, or similar voice assistants like Siri or Alexa, but they're based on the same idea. You can ask a question and it can answer in an intelligent way. What are, you, what are you seeing in relocation, or what we are seeing in relocation is a need for intelligent software, not just software, but smart software. Software that can harness an employee's unique data and circumstances and prove that it understands their exact needs in real time. Yeah, and while this kind of technology and relocation is obviously still very early on, the beginnings of this are already at work. So take, for example, at UrbanBound with, with our relocation software. When a relocating employee gets access to UrbanBound, they start off by seeing what the policy is that their employer is providing them. Then the software has an intake process where it essentially walks the employee through a bunch of questions to really understand their specific needs. Do they have a car? Do they live in an apartment? Are they going to be looking to buy a home at their new location, et cetera, et cetera. Then the software takes this information into account and actually configures the employee's experience in their dashboard in a way that it shows them specific services that we know now that they need to book. So this kind of process takes relocation from being a very kind of canned and almost static experience to a much more tailored experience. And because the employee provides the information, the software really can spit it back out much more relevant solutions for them. That's so cool. So it's obvious that the next wave of Relo technology is going to take an even more nuanced approach to the data it collects. So soon it will, we will be able to see how things are unfolding in real time and make adjustments for employees on their behalf. And I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Me too. So to wrap this section up, 
Consumer trends are important because they influence the expectations employees have with their employers and the software that they're probably being provided. You know, with the skills gap, companies must do everything they can to set themselves apart to find the talent that they need and get them where they need to be in order to do their job. When you offer relocation as a benefit, how you offer it is something that potential employees will evaluate. And if companies pay attention to these trends and somehow work them into their own policies, they will see it pay off in the form of more people accepting those critical job offers. And one more thing I want to add to that, Michael, is as an HR professional, we have to remember that relocation is the first touch point on those new hires. And it's so important to make sure that that's a good experience. Yeah. And it speaks volumes to how an employee thinks about their, how about their talent. I completely agree. So switching gears, our next topic brings us to remote work and its impact on relocation. We've mentioned the difficulty in finding top talent with the U.S.'s ever decreasing unemployment rate. And in order to win top talent, companies need to be flexible. The question is, will remote work replace the need to even relocate? Great question, Michael. One recent study shows that flexible work hours and location have become one of the most requested employee perks in the last couple of years. And while 40% of 40% more U.S. employers offer flexible workspace workplace options than they did five years ago. Only 7% make it available to all of their employees. And I can honestly say, I don't think that remote work will replace Relo. In fact, friendly public service announcement, especially for those at smaller companies, a person can't just work remotely wherever they want. So legal entity must be set up in each state and each country before someone in your company can work there remotely. So I advise you to check with your payroll team or your legal team, tax team, if you aren't sure if your company is set up to pay payroll and report payroll and income in those locations. That's a really great point. And going off of that, working from home is not something that works for everybody or for all types of employees. Studies have actually shown that the majority of telecommuting employees are over the age of 35 and have college degrees. Full-time remote work is less likely an option for certain types of work, so it can be tricky to allow work from home policies for some parts of the company, but not all. And while it does seem like more um, remote work is on the rise, corporate America is cutting back on its work from home programs. A recent study conducted by Upwork found that 57% of companies don't have a remote work policy. So take, for example, companies like Yahoo, Reddit, IBM, Bank of America, who have all ended their telecommuting policies in the last couple of years. We're bringing back most of their remote work workers into the office. I've been in some form of tech my entire career, and Indeed is a little bit different. Um, we have a flexible culture, but not a remote culture. This is the first place that touts collaboration and actually practices it. And our leaders have created a fun and energetic environment. And as a result of that, we actually love coming into the office. I, I'm awesome. kind of sad when I work from home. I can feel it here. Yeah. <laughs> and at um, the office, there are plenty of collaborative open spaces and comfortable couches. So we don't have to be tethered to a desk either. And what I mean by flexible is if an employee needs the flexibility to work from home on occasion, you know, um, for any reason, there are some remote work exceptions, but it's, it's not the norm. Yeah, agreed. Ultimately, it's wise for HR teams to support workplace flexibility, but at the end of the day, the majority of companies don't allow work from home on a full-time basis. So you might wonder why that is the case. Well, if you think about it, full-time remote work often comes at the expense of building a company's culture. Think about companies like Facebook and Google and Apple who have actually designed their offices with intent in order to be able to create serendipitous moments. These collaborative interactions can fuel more creativity and innovation. So when you take people out of the physical workplace community, you may lose some of those important moments. I think you nailed it when you said remote working comes at the expense of culture and connecting. And I also don't think that rigidity works. Because we're so mobile and can work anywhere, I think it makes sense to let employees work remotely on occasion when there may be a sick child or a plumber coming to fix a water heater. Um, why, why make employees take personal time off when they can, can and want to work? For example, 
I let my team take a work from home day a week because sometimes we just need a day to focus without interruption. And, you know, the one day a week really hasn't um, impeded our culture in any way. Yeah, that's awesome. And I completely agree with what you just said. I'd say the best advice that I could personally give is that it's, it's different for every company. You've got to do what works best for your organization and company culture. And I think that you said it best, Rebecca, consider a flexible culture versus a completely remote culture. Yeah. Okay. So I want to transition a little to make sure we have enough time for some of those questions as well. So really the last thing we wanted to formally talk about is everyone's favorite subject, tax legislation. Yay. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed at the end of 2017 eliminated a number of deductions that U.S. taxpayers had actually come to rely on. As many of you on the line may or may not already know, one of these was the moving expense deduction. The act eliminated the deduction for the tax year 2018 through the tax year 2025. This deduction used to include household goods moves, 30 days of uh, storage of your goods in transit, and final travel to the new destination. That's right. So with the, new exception, with the exception of military moves, all move expenses are taxable now. This doesn't include the two-deed home sale program through an RMC. And this has driven the overall cost of relocation up for companies who wish to cover the tax liability or it drives up the cost for employees whose employer has chosen to, chosen to put the burden on the employee, which means the employee pays the tax at the end of the year. And this isn't a good experience. Interestingly, nearly a year later, there are 11 states that have not conformed to this due to their own state legislation um, or by default based on the laws they had before. Yes. So to that point, you guys will see, you know, this information out in front of you. That means there are 11 states where moving expenses are tax excludable on the state level. That the five states that have passed legislation to make moving expenses deductible or excludable specifically are Arizona, Hawaii, Iowa, New York, and Virginia, which you see up on your screen here. Then there are six states that did not pass legislation, but rather defaulted to pre-tax reform law. That means that the following states still have tax excludable status on moving expenses at the state level. They may decide to pass legislation to conform to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this tax excludable status is subject to change. And those states are Arkansas, California, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Also consider if you operate in a state that has not passed legislation or one that does not have state income tax like Tennessee, Washington State, Florida, and Texas, there's no way to offset the federal liability through state um, write-offs, if you will. So you may be feeling the tax changes more. Michael and I are not tax experts, but um, these were the states that were listed as of November 28th of this year. So please reach out to your own legal or tax experts with, with further questions around how this legislation is impacting your program. That's right. We are definitely not tax experts, so I will reiterate that point. But that being said, just because these 11 states currently have tax excludable status on their few relocation expenses, the federal rate and federal program still applies. That means the cost of relocation has definitely gone up, either for the employer or for the employee, as you mentioned. And I'll say, to provide the best employee experience, companies would be wise to gross up the relocation benefits. I'm gonna guess that most of your employees aren't tax experts and they will be in for a rude awakening during tax season when they see what they owe after their relocation. If you aren't gonna gross up, it's important to communicate clearly the tax responsibility before they accept their offer or that relocation assignment. That's right. And if you are grossing up, there are ways to offset some costs to cover that gross up and help relocation costs be as predictable as possible. And one of those things that we're seeing is an increased demand for better efficiency. And I will personally argue that if you have software driving a lot of the process, it will be less expensive to administer just by default. But also one of the big ones, Rebecca, and I think you can really speak to this, is by reducing the household goods moves weight. That's right. 
Not having household goods as a tax excludable item is a big hit to the industry, especially for companies who offered household goods as part of their core program. What I've seen and what I would do is look into a donate and discard program. There are basically different companies that will come in and help your employees or new hires get rid of furniture and other junk and basically reduce the weight, which reduce the cost. Some of these will even help eBay items, donate items, and do trash hauls. By reducing the weight of these shipments, the overall cost goes down, which offsets the gross tip. For example, I had a move from Atlanta to Austin where the company saved $14,000, this is not including gross up, by eliminating weight. Hmm. And the gross up on that 14,000 would have been around 7,000. So a $24,000 move would have cost $36,000 with the tax added. Um, it ended up costing only $15,000 with the growth up. Wow. So regardless of taxability, I love these programs. Yeah, that is awesome. So I know, right? So after tax reform passed in the US, there was also this initial trend to control costs by simply offering lump sum. So the pendulum sw swung the other way. Hmm. Give the employees cash and see them when they get to the new job on their first day. But I think what people don't realize is that there's a way to control the cost and offer support. And I think we'll get to this in the Q&A section, but what I'm talking about here is offering a managed lump sum over a traditional lump sum, which goes back to offering not just money, but resources and support on how to manage that money and get help during the process while fostering flexibility. That's <laughs> our word for today. Uh, yes, a good word. <laughs> so now that you mentioned, it, I think it actually is a good time to start transitioning to the more Q&A part of the presentation. And again, if you have any questions for Rebecca or myself, uh, and you're interested in learning more, please type in your questions and submit them. We will try to get to them. Um, but we did have some that were submitted in advance. So we wanted to make sure we tackle those first. So Rebecca, you know, you've been watching this industry and these trends for 20-ish years now, and you've seen the industry evolve, particularly in the last few years. I want to look forward and see what you think we'll see more of in 2019. You know, specifically, you, managed, you, you mentioned uh, managed lump sum. Can you actually expand on that idea and talk about what this might mean for the industry? I think it can mean lower costs for companies. It definitely means higher customer satisfaction through flexibility for employees. Great. Maybe. Okay, so some, some people might call a managed lump sum a capped lump sum. So let's define it. A managed lump sum is like a credit that an employee has to use for relocation benefits, and it's usually managed by a relocation management company. So let's say someone has a managed lump sum amount of $10,000, and it's being managed by Urban Bound. The employee does not get the $10,000 in their bank account, but they can either use Urban Bound suppliers like moving companies, realtors, mortgage companies and have those expenses direct billed against their lump sum or they can pay for things themselves and submit those receipts for reimbursement against that lump sum. So historically HR loved the concept of managed lump sums but the managed lump sum didn't work well because either the HR person managing the program or the relocation management company would have to manually track invoices and manually keep a balance like an old school checkbook, right? Yep. And because the bills didn't come through in real time, there was no bandwidth to manage cap lump sum programs. So relocation technology companies like Urban Bound have revolutionized Relo by creating managed lump sum tools. Yay, <laughs> our jobs are easier. So companies love managed lump sums because they're easy to budget, there's no surprises, and employees love them because they're not held to specific use it or lose it benefits. What's great about a partner like Urban Bound is that the offerings apply to programs whether you have five relocations a year or 500 relocations a year. Many traditional RMCs won't take on small clients, but with tech-based products, like Urban Bound, they can. And I came from the RMC side, and I can tell you they're really, some of them are scrambling to catch up in this space. Um, another thing I wanna mention is traditionally offering set benefits like home sale and home purchase and household goods, it made sense because a set package worked for the majority of the people moving. Over the past 10 years, we 
seen a big shift. Employees want to trade their benefits in for what they need more. And neither HR or the relocation management company, again, had the bandwidth to handle all these exceptions. And these problems are eliminated with a choice-based tech-driven model. Hmm. Um, here's an interesting scenario. And one thing that was considered when Indeed decided to build a managed lump sum element into the program. Now, I will say, we have a cash element and they get the cash. We have a core set of benefits. We know people need temporary housing. We know they need final move travel. But then we have a managed lump sum element as well. So it's a three-part program. And with a fully loaded renter relocation, including lease breakage, you know, all of the standard moving, moving cost, that, that on average costs $35,000 for a renter. With a gross up included. With the gross up included, yeah. And we found that we can offer a package that is estimated and averaging around $13,000 and still have a 4.8 satisfaction rate on a five point scale. And why is that? Because our employees get to use that managed lump sum for any cost that is generated because of their relocation. They get to choose what they want. And um, we don't have to guess what everybody needs and they're happy. So if they wanna use that entire managed lump sum on shipping their 12 cats, knock, they can knock themselves out, like <laughs> go for it. Um, and this may be surprising, but we're using the same application for executives, Whoa. clutch your pearls. <laughs> and when someone asks if we offer home sale or home purchase to an exec, you know, if an executive asks us, hey, do you have a home purchase or home sale in your relocation? We actually don't have to tell them no. What we say is you can absolutely buy or sell a home and use your closing documents to get reimbursed reimbursed by your managed lump sum. Hmm. It really ties back to what we were talking about earlier, frankly. It's all about that that user experience, giving somebody the degree of choice and flexibility to leverage their relocation benefit, it's really resulting in higher employee satisfaction, I would imagine. Exactly. I think we're, we're finding out it's not necessarily about the amount of the benefit. It's really about the experience and the flexibility of choice. So speaking of that, a couple questions have actually been submitted um, that are relating to the gross up that we were speaking about just now and earlier as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions is just straight out, what is a gross up? So I'm just going to take one second, just walk everybody on the line here who's not quite familiar with what we're talking about, just so we're all on the same page. So um, if you let's use the example of a person who, let's say, is receiving a $10,000 relocation benefit to help them with their various uh, relocation costs. Previously, if the bulk of that was going to be spent on certain categories like moving your household goods, those 30 days of storage of those goods while you're moving, uh, that final destination trip, if all of that, let's say, totaled out to $10,000 in, in our example here, because of the way the tax laws were written in you know, December 31st, 2017 and earlier, all of those got to be treated as tax exempt expenses. So the employer would obviously treat them as an ordinary business expense and the employee actually didn't owe any taxes as a result of receiving that benefit. With the tax law change beginning earlier this year, January 1st, now those benefits, if I were to spend those save $10,000 in exactly the way I just described, those same $10,000 worth of benefits now are required to be treated as a taxable benefit. In other words, it will appear on an employee's W-2 and a tax uh, is going to need to be collected and paid to the various government entities. So um, in general, in, in you know, kind of your, your average sense, most employers will find that they would need to account for the equivalent of having provided, let's say about $15,000 of benefit in order to cover the average, call it 33% tax liability that the employees are going to average out at given federal, state, local, et cetera, taxes that they might be collecting. And let me, you sound like a tax expert. I don't mean to be. So, <laughs> so definitely I, verify everything I just said. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to add to that. So he, one of the ways that I explain it to relocating employees is this $10,000 using Michael's example is going to hit your W-2 at the end of the year. Our payroll team is going to gross that up or pay the tax on your behalf 
It does not go in your bank account. It is paid on your payroll reporting. So at the end of the year, if that is grossed up, there's no tax liability to the employee. Exactly. And I think when we talk, just like we said a moment ago about good user experience, this is one of those things that once again, you really want to think about what it's like if you're the employee and your company has chosen not to cover that gross up tax. And all of a sudden you're essentially sending that employee a bill when they file their taxes, mm -hmm. April 15th of the subsequent year, they're going to realize, Oh my gosh, I owe money. I thought I was getting money back this year. All of a sudden I owe money because I moved for this job and my employer didn't cover it. So again, going back to that user experience and what, how you want to portray how you're helping your employees with their relocation, I would strongly consider you to, you know, to think about the gross, the gross up. And you said something about um, making that lump sum payment. If you are paying lump sum only and you are paying that through payroll and you choose to not gross that up, then think of this. You have a new hire, an employee who in their offer letter or relocation agreement says they get $10,000 and if payroll deducts the tax up front, so the company doesn't have to pay it and the employee doesn't have to pay it, but that stinks mm -hmm. because you still want that whole $10,000. So I would encourage you, one of the things that we did to change this at Indeed is where we may have given $10,000 before, we now put 7,500 in their offer letter and we gross it up. So it's costing the company the same Thing. Our cost did not increase and the employee experience is better because they're actually getting in their pocket exactly the number that's in their offer. And I think that's it. It's about managing expectations. Exactly. I think that's a perfect approach. Okay. Um, here was another question that, uh, you know, had, had kind of come in in advance of this. Um, what other trends are we seeing with tech forward innovative companies? You know, I, my peers and probably everyone on the call, everybody's looking for ways to do more with less and cut cost while keeping true to their company culture. And um, you know what? This isn't a one size fits all, but there's so many applications for managed lump sums that can work with any culture. Going through the list of questions here. So we mentioned the impact of the US tax reform. What kind of impact did it have on your program? And are there other ways to control costs? Um, I was so lucky in the space. There was no formal program set up at Indeed when I started 14 months ago. And I was really asked to build this program from dust up. Mm -hmm. So when we launched in April, it was after tax reform. So I was able to take the, that, those new tax laws into consideration when we built the program. Got it. But it, had I been at my last job, um, we were already using discard and donate because it already was cutting cost for us. But I still would encourage people who have more traditional benefit packages to, you know, to explore that. Cool. Let's see, here's another one. Uh, we've really pushed the need for technology to be at the center of a relocation program, but some would argue that the older generation doesn't want software. What can you say about the differences between the various generations that are can, you know, at the same workplace? Yeah. You know what, I don't think it's generational. Yeah. I, I really think it's a personal preference. Um, I think everyone should have a portal or a central location to track their move benefits and somewhere where they can go 24 seven, but, I think they want to still have a live person or even a online chat if they have a question. And I think if I mentioned this before, I think if we let the pendulum swing too far away from the personal touch with the millennials that most of them haven't relocated before professionally mm -hmm. and they actually need more help. They don't know what they don't know. Yeah. It's a really, really good point. You know, I know we have a lot of people on the line who probably aren't necessarily mobility professionals. Um, you know, relocation continues to be pushed on HR and talent acquisition teams is what I'm finding. Mm -hmm. How can relocation play a part in a company's overall talent acquisition strategy? So when I started in this industry, um, mobility trend was to be almost in finance and then it moved to comp and bin and then HR ops. And, and I agree, I'm seeing TA, um, TA or talent acquisition is where mobility Living. is starting to live right and, and that's where we sit here at indeed mm -hmm. and 
relocation can definitely push some of those offers across the goal line. You know, when we're talking about war on talent. So I'd encourage those of you who have Relo as just a small part of your scope, but need help, tap into your local re or regional relocation councils. And another great resource is the Worldwide Employee Relocation Council. And they have a great library of resources as well as fantastic corporate benchmarking groups who are really willing to share and, and help. Yeah, and you guys will hopefully see on your screens right now, uh, here's uh, the link to the uh, to Worldwide ERC. Uh, it is a phenomenal, a phenomenal organization that can give you a tremendous amount of information. So what advice can you give to someone, Rebecca, who maybe relocation is not their main focus? You know, what are the three or four main things that they should be focusing their time on? I think... Um, compliance is always key, right? Make sure that you're working with your stakeholders like payroll, tax and finance, compensation and benefits, because all of those groups and peers are impacted by what we do in relocation. So, you know, you want to keep your peers happy, right? And you want to make sure that the people who know where you need to be compliant are engaged when you're building your program. And I am a firm believer of building out a philosophy that aligns with your culture. Mm -hmm. And that way that gives you a framework to refer back to, especially when employees or say hiring managers want to do their own thing. Um, a lot of times you can go back and say, you know what, that does not apply to our culture that we built this program on. And I find that very helpful. And then if, if there's anybody on here who's ever heard me talk about Relo, probably not. Um, so hopefully you're hearing it for the first time. It's know your company culture. And I know we've said that a lot, but there's a couple ways that you can build a relocation program. And there's a traditional, um, I'm sorry, a transactional mindset. And that transactional mindset is just move people. I don't want to hear about it. Just get them moved, get them just going. Get there. And that might be your company culture and that's okay. Um, or you can build out a more strategic program where you're strategizing with, you know, the leaders to say, hey, we're opening a new office in Beijing. Rebecca, what does immigration look like? And that sounds like we're doing that, and indeed we're not. So <laughs> don't, don't jump to any conclusions. Um, and personally, I have worked on a program before, and at, I'm a strategic thinker. I'm like, what's new? What's next? What can we do tomorrow? Yeah, well, and the company culture that I was in was a transactional. And I was trying to force that square peg into that round hole. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so know what your culture is, is basically, or it's just going to make your life harder. <laughs> so for, for those of us, you know, for those folks on the line that are starting to evaluate maybe creating more of a program around their, their relocation needs, their mobility programs. What are some, you know, thoughts you might give to them if they're actually starting the process of evaluating a potential partner in the mobility space to help them? Okay. Um, you know what? I always want to know what is their philosophy and does it match your philosophy? I think that's important. Um, what problem are you trying to solve within your mobility space and how can they help solve it? This is going to tell you if they're creative problem solvers or if they're a one size fits all, if they have a one size fits all approach to their clients mm -hmm. or their offerings. What size clients do they support? Because you want to understand if you have a really small program and the relocation company that you're looking at has all the huge Fortune 500s, are you going to get lost in their Shuffle. portfolio? Right. Um, do your due diligence. You know what? There are great people that work at every one of these RMCs and their salespeople. It is their job to have a great pitch, but talk to suppliers that work with them. If you can talk to um, your peers who may use them. And one of the questions that I always put on my RFP or my bid would be, I want to talk to clients that no longer partner with them. And I want to understand why. It's hmm. really good advice. Okay, so we are coming up to the top of the hour, and I want to make sure that we get everybody out of here on time. I know there's a little bit of a uh, wrap up at the end. So Rebecca, first of all, thank you so much for all of your insights. Those were incredible answers, and I certainly learned many things on this uh, in this conversation. 
Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me. Okay, so on the slide, you'll see a few different ways to stay in the loop with us. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more of these webinars in 2019, and I really would love to encourage everyone to follow us on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Also, if you're interested in learning more about UrbanBound, you can go to our website on the screen here to set up a time to see a demonstration of our software and learn some relocation program benchmarking. We'll also be sending everyone who attended today a copy of our ultimate guide to evaluating relocation partners. And if you have a question and we were not able to get to it, we will try to follow up with you after the webinar. Um, I really want to thank everyone who participated today. Rebecca, any last thoughts as we uh, move on? No, I, I, I think that does it, but thanks again for having me. This was fun. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks everyone. Uh, as you're leaving the webcast, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey. I want to encourage you to please fill that out. We do read those answers and it helps us with future webinars that we plan for. And uh, please, get, again, give us any feedback that you might have. Have a great rest of your day, uh, hr.com. I will be uh, handing it back over to you for final housekeeping. I'd like to thank our presenters as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording and slides will be available for up to seven days for our free members and without restrictions for those with our certification membership. The webcast credit will show in your hr.com account within two business days and we will also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.